Well, in the interest of time, let's get started. And I'm thinking that it might make sense for us to do introductions first, since we're such a small group. Um, so I'm not on this right now on the monitoring team. I'm Well, I am on the monitoring team right now, but I'm not on the slide. I'm going to be making a transition um, pretty soon next week. Um, so I am Leora Byrus, and I'm um, currently on the monitoring team, and we're going to go through today um, regional program monitoring. And with me today is Colette Sullivan. Can you come on, Colette? Sure, of course. Morning, everybody. Colette Sullivan, Federal Programs Coordinator, and uh, great to see everybody. And Jennifer? Hello, I am Jennifer Gleason. Hoping to fill some Leora shoes soon. <laughs> <laughs> and Carly? Hi, I'm Carly Thibodeau, one of the members of the monitoring team. Perfect. And Julie? Hi, I'm Julie Pelletier. I'm the admin support for this fabulous team. Awesome. Okay. So can we go through you guys and can you guys just introduce yourself as well? I have you on the side, so I'll just go from top down. Jenny Scribner, would you introduce yourself and let us know which program you're from, please? Yes. Good morning. I am a special education teacher in Oxford Hills at the Western Maine Regional Program. Perfect. Thank you. And Maria Noble Brown. Yes, I am also a special education teacher that works for the Western Maine program, which is part of SAD 17. Awesome. Thank you. And Lisa Karen. Hi, Lisa Karen. I'm the executive director for the Western Maine regional program. Awesome. And I feel like we have a little bit of a celebrity here because I was watching MADSAC from home <laughs> with Pat Menzel here with wonderful things being said about you. So I'm Pat Menzel. I am one of the directors affiliated with the Western Maine Regional Program. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, and Nicole Norton. Hi, I am the social worker with Western Maine Regional. Okay, perfect. So this is us. And thank you for coming on and introducing yourself. That's very helpful. Um, so regional program monitoring is about school approval which is different than the public school monitoring process. So after, so you will not get a corrective action plan, you get a letter of correction. Um, and after that letter of correction is issued, um, a school approval letter will be issued by the commissioner, which will um, give you four more years to keep on um, doing the good work that you're doing with your students um, before you go through the monitoring process again. Um, IEPs are not looked at through this, through the program monitoring. We look at the IEPs through the sending school districts or the member school districts, um, because I'm sure, as you know, that regional programs work under a cooperative agreement, which is also called an interlocal agreement. And um, part of that agreement talks about, you know, the fiscal people and, um, you know, sort of which district involved is in charge of what, et cetera. But it is considered an out-of-district program because the kids are not with their general education peers. So that's why we look at the IEPs through the sending school districts rather than through you, um, because those sending school districts still remain responsible for FAPE, just like if a regional program was an SPPS. So hopefully that makes sense for you. Um, so there's currently six regional programs in Maine. Um, there's the Bangor Regional Multi-Handicap, Bangor Regional Therapeutic Day, and those are both sort of together in an interesting way. Um, and sometimes they're called spruce. So if you see spruce in any regional program um, information, it's, it's those programs together. Um, there's the Compass Behavior Support Program and the Pathways Educational Center for Programming, um, and those are both part of AOS 93. 
Um, there's Western Maine Regional Program for Students with Disabilities, um, which operates in both South Paris and New Suncook, which you guys are all familiar with. And there's also the Western Foothills Regional Program, which is in Rumford. And I should have said this, if I go too fast or if there's any questions, um, please feel free to interrupt me and I'll I'll try to remember to go slower and to stop for questions. So Leora, can I just ask, what does the, the big program up in Bangor? I know that their fiscal agent is the Bangor School Department. What kind of program is that? So they have two. There's a behavioral um, program uh, for mostly kids with, you know, ED, OHI, autism. Um, and there's also a separate one so it's separate on paper because they have separate cooperative agreements, but this sort of overarching group, that's why it's a little bit different. Um, and that's when they're called the Spruce Piece, which is Southern Penobscot Regional something something that I can never remember. It's okay. Thank you. I'm sorry. Okay. And then there, the multi-handicap. The multi-handicap is actually at their high school, and that is for students who are extremely, extremely high needs. So that's sort of the breakup of those two. All right. Great. Thank you. Of course. Uh, okay. Nope. I didn't go over this yet. So there is an approval document that we are required to go over as part of the monitoring process. All of this information should be covered in your current cooperative agreement. Um, if part of this process will be reviewing that cooperative agreement to make sure that these components are there. So it might be a good idea for you to just take a peek at your cooperative agreement and just make sure these pieces are there because if they're not, then you'll need to make sure you um, talk with your legal team and get that um, get that updated before the end of the process. So one of the things that we look at, the criteria is that there are two or more SAUs that provide regional special education programs and support services. And you'll notice that we put all of the references in here um, and they are from 20A. So 20A is the, um, the overarching um, law that governs regional programs. And of course, you're also, um, because it's special education, you're also responsible for making sure that all the MUSER regulations are followed as well. So the evidence that we would look, like, look at in your cooperative agreement is that the participating SAUs are listed, um, that there's at least one that's, uh, well, there would only be one, that is the fiscal agent. And I know for you guys, it's 17, um, that there is a section about entering and withdrawing the agreement. Um, that there are program objectives and functions, like the why, why are you putting this together? Um, and there's also information about the location of the pro program and who owns the pro program. So which of the districts, um, you know, own the actual physical buildings that the regional programs are in. And there is one piece um, about regional programs as well is that they're not allowed to have new construction. Um, and I don't think that's coming into play for any of you guys right now. Um, and there also needs to be um, in the cooperative agreement um, information about the administration and identifying the employees of all the program staff. Um, so the another piece is that the agreement needs to make sure that it has admission and requirements. So how are the students identified and how are they, um, how do they come into the regional program? Um, all of the staff need to be certified. There should be a plan of instruction. There should be adequacy of facilities. So we'll actually come and just visit. We're not like measuring anything, looking at anything. We don't have white gloves on that we're doing, you know, a sweep of anything. It's really just a walkthrough. Um, and most of the time we're just like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. So, so um, it's 
you know, it's not something that, you know, people need to get particularly anxious about. Um, so we look at the support services and that's done in this, um, cooperative agreement. And it's also done with the related service grids, which I'm going to talk about in a few slides. Um, the agreement should talk about supervision, who is going to supervise and provide that to the staff, student, student teacher ratio, and also parent and community participation. So all of these things should be addressed in that agreement. And there's actually quite a few more. Um, so there's a, there are fiscal requirements. And so particularly for your program, it is RSU 17. That is the, um, the fiscal agent of the cooperative agreement. So they're identified in that um, agreement. and it specifies um, that they are responsible for making sure that the facilities are adequate and that um, all of the basic school approval process is um, compliant unless that agreement designates another SAU uh, to be responsible for those things. So in that cooperative agreement, it needs to say who's involved, who is responsible for the physical environment, um, who owns it, et cetera. Um, and there should be a plan that talks about fiscal operation and cost sharing. And this is what I was talking about before. There is a provision that there's no school construction permitted. Um, for the purposes of special education program. And I have no idea why that is, but don't get excited about building a new building, I guess, because that's not gonna, that's not gonna happen this year. Um, any questions before I go on to the next section? And you, you will get all of this information. Probably Jennifer, I would think, will send you this um, after, after we're talking right now so that you'll have this to refer back to. So um, in the cooperative agreement, there should be admission requirements. So there should be a plan that talks about how students are gonna be admitted through the program um, and how that determination of student need um, is, is looked at. And that is gonna be looked at in the cooperative agreement. We also look at that piece um, as part of reviewing written notices. So um, when, we, when we come on site and we look at your documents, we're looking in written notices to make sure that the IEP team has documented that this the particular student needs this level of, um, of support in order to access FAPE. Um, and the next part talks about that teacher certification and the teacher-student ratio, because we need to make sure that all of the folks um, are certified. And this will, it, it needs to be part of the cooperative agreement, like that piece of, yes, we're gonna make sure that all of our folks are certified, et cetera. Um, and it also would be addressed during the annual update forms, which you will be receiving today so that you can um, fill those out for the past school year. Um, the plan of instruction should be talked about in the cooperative agreement. Um, it should talk about what kind of written curriculum you're using. It doesn't have to specifically state the curriculum, but it needs to, there needs to be some kind of provision that talks about your um, educational uh, curriculum being aligned to the main learning results. Um, description of assessments, because just don't forget that even though they're out of district placement kids, they're still um, required under federal law to participate in assessments. And there should be some kind of conversation in the collaborative agreement about how the students can access extracurricular activities um, as part of their public school, their sending schools, if that's something that they are interested in.
Okay. We're almost done with this piece. So there's also in the cooperative agreement, there should be um, a discussion about related services, including transportation um, and the, how that's going to be addressed and that professional supervision piece, um, which would include a statement of assurance that there are program administrators on site. So each of the um, each site, um, and I note there's only one program, um, one regional program that actually has two sites, and it happens to be you guys. Um, so there needs to be a program administer, um, uh, administrator, pardon me, um, at each of those sites. And this is the last piece that's really talking about that cooperative agreement, and it really talks about funding. So um, it should talk about how students, you know, how the tuition works. So um, each of the members of the cooperative agreement um, should have, you know, a tuition rate. How is that going to be used? Um, and it it can't exceed the actual student at uh, the actual per student cost um, that is that is um, part of special education programming. Um, and the last piece is that um, there should be a statement of assurance that the regional program is supported by funds included in the special education appropriations of each member SAU. So there should be some kind of a statement in there that talks about how each SAU is contributing financially to the um, cooperative agreement uh, for the regional program. Okay, any questions about that piece? No, but Leah, I have a, I, I have a, kind of a question. Yeah. Um, and maybe it's just information for you. Um, just due to staffing issues, mm -hmm. um, the level site is not being used at this time. It was shut okay. down. So okay. there's really only one site working right now, um, okay. which is in Oxford. Um, okay. Okay. Um, that's... So I, I am going to send um, the annual update form today, and if you could just make a note on that form of that so that we can just get that back and have it, that would be super helpful. Okay. Thank will that you. come to me or will it go to Lisa, these forms? Which, yeah. which makes the most sense? To me, it makes sense that Lisa do what she's the executive okay. director. Okay. Um, and I mean, I'll be involved in the review um, like I was last time, but, um, you know, she's really in charge. Perfect. Then so. I will make sure that, if, or pardon me, Jennifer will make sure that all the communications go to Lisa. So, but you will be getting the annual update form for me today, but I will make sure it gets to Lisa. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Leora, Thank you. does um, <clears throat> Julie send out all your stuff because they had my incorrect email up until about two weeks ago and I made sure Julie um, had my correct email. Yes, so, and she okay, forwarded great. that to me and I am updating our regional program contact information now. So I will make sure that that is correct on that form. Um, the communications about the cohort, the site visit will come from Julie. However, when we get when you get into the sort of nitty gritty of the monitoring and the related service provider grids go out and things like that, I believe that will be Jennifer that you'll be hearing from. Okay, great. Thank you. Absolutely. But any of the, any of the people on this team can help you. Like they will, they will answer you. They will get it to Jennifer. They'll get it to Julie. So if something happens and Jennifer's email address poofs out of the matrix, just Talk with other one of the other people and they'll find her. <laughs> okay, so this is the annual update form. This is what I was talking about sending today. Um, so normal, well, moving forward, it will be Jennifer that is sending this out. And this is, and I will make sure to CC her on all of these today as well so that they come back to her. Um, 
So this talks about any changes in staffing, programming, and location. So um, the fact that the level location isn't is no longer opening, um, if there's any new staff, either in or out, um, if you are participating in the Linda Mood Bell, um, you know, curriculum training that, you know, um, that the department's doing, you can make a note of that. So really any changes that are that have happened so that we can we can keep up on this. Um, and, and I'll be honest, historically, this has been tough to get back from people. So if you could actually fill it out and get it back, it would be super duper helpful. Leora, do you know if you gotten any like last year or the year before? From the I, I do not. I would have to check my files, but okay. I know that it's been it's I assume that it's because of COVID, it's been very challenging to, to have these returned. And I'm guessing there's a deadline on when you'd like to have those. Just as soon as you can get it back, you know, um, maybe that's what's missing in the emails is that I, we never put in a deadline. <laughs> I would guess um, the way most directors operate, that might be it. That actually, that could very well be it. So, um, how long, what do you think is reasonable, Lisa? Two weeks? Well, I haven't been the executive director very long. So um, I would think, I can't see the whole thing as I've gone to see the people too, but I think that that, and what if we're in the process of hiring someone, but they haven't been approved yet by the board? Hmm. Great question. Uh, maybe include that in your email. Okay. And we'll at least have that information. And I expect approval is going to happen within the next week, but I just want to make sure. Uh, okay. Well, then, you know, if if we say that two weeks is a, is a good timeline, then um, then maybe you'll have that information by the end of that time. I hope so. And you can always. So one of the things that I've really encouraged the team to do, um, because we, you know, we took this over from from Roberta and Dan and David when we came on. And so one of the things that um, I've really encouraged the team to look at moving forward is having like every three month check in meetings with the directors and the fiscal directors of regional programs, even when you're not in cohort because there's so many changes that happen. It's a pretty dynamic process and we know that. Um, and sometimes we don't find things out um, because people either don't know that they should let us know or they don't know who's actually doing the overseeing. So um, I, I'm pretty sure that's gonna be happening. So stay tuned for, for um for communication probably from Julie at first and then from Jennifer to really look at scheduling those. And I, I would suspect that those will be quick and quick meetings, um, like, hey, what's going on? Any questions kind of thing? Um, but I think that's something that's really been lacking up till now. And that would be really helpful to start doing. So right now, Leora, these are only done annually and not expected to be done every time there's a change of staff. Correct. Example within the year. Correct. Okay. All right. Yes. But we want to make sure that moving forward, when people have questions or there's new directors or, you know, anything like that, that happens that, you know, the regional programs, it's very clear about who you go to for support. And I'm not sure that that's been clear so far. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. And that'll be, and I don't know if I already said that, that'll be for every, all six of the regional programs, not just you're in co not just when you're in cohort. Okay. Um, all right. So um you as the regional programs are monitored every four years, and it involves both a desk audit and a site visit. Um, the regional program's fiscal agent will receive a receives a letter of instruction that talks about the process. And this process is mandated under OSEP, the Office of Special Education Programming. And there's a memo called 0902, and that's what we base this on. Um, and it's also based on MUSER, Maine Unified Special Education Regulations. So 
um, the process. There are related services grids that are emailed in April by probably Jennifer, I would say. <laughs> Um, and that's part of just the monitoring process. So you'll pick a five-week period between April 25th-ish and the end of the school year, and you'll fill out a related services grid for each student. And I know that this is a little bit small. I should have made it bigger, but this is an example of what it would look like if it's filled out. So you can see that there are student initials, and then it talks about speech therapy, physical therapy, OT, and social work services, and then other, because it could be teacher of the blind or visually impaired. It could be BCBA. Um, and you're you're going to fill out what the child received for their services. So we're just making sure that, so this form um, is ensuring that the students are receiving the related services that are part of their IEP programming. Can I so ask a question here? Uh-huh. If they are not receiving the services due to refusal, are we supposed to document that amount of time? Yes. I uh, yes. If they're refusing, write a note that they're refusing, um, and and talk about what time you know what their time is supposed to be, and then that they're refusing those services. Yep. So transportation is not included on this grid, and that's okay. That is okay. Yes, All because right. the transportation should be addressed as part of the cooperative agreement, um, and. So that's part of that piece. And okay. so we're looking at, um, you know, sort of in, in this five-week period, were the students getting the services that they're supposed to per their IEP? So it's um, only that, that five weeks? Only that five-week period. And it can be any five-week period between the end of April and the end of the school year that you like. Um, I have another question on that real quick. Uh-huh. So if, uh, so for example, like our students, you know, have accommodations for access to social worker as needed mm -hmm. in addition to their required social work minutes. Yep. So would that need to get low, um, added in as well? So would it be the total they received or so if they like took advantage of added sessions, would that be documented? That is a great question. And I am going to to need to ask um, Roberta Lucas about that. Um, I assume it needs to match their IEP. That's typically exactly. My first do. thought is no, because as needed is is as needed, okay. um, and and this is really about alignment with the IEP. Sure. Yeah, I just wanted to double check and make sure if it was um, recording what they actually received or just what their you know scheduled to be receiving. Well, it is supposed to record what they're actually receiving, okay. but as it aligns to the IEP. So if they're supposed to be receiving 30 minutes twice a week of speech therapy, but they only receive 20 minutes, um, that's what you would record is, is that 20 minutes. Great. Um, yeah, so let me let me check on that as needed piece. I suspect it does not need to be recorded here because that's not, um, you know, part of section seven of the IEP. Jennifer, did you make a note of this this question? Thank you very much. Okay, so we'll check on that. Perfect. Thank you. Yes. Okay, so the site visit, we actually, well, we did not, Jennifer, in her Excel guru-ness, um, we actually have an electronic monitoring tool for this. This this is a copy of the paper copy, uh, a snippet of the paper copy, but we're looking for the exact same information. We're just filling it out on an Excel spreadsheet instead of doing a paper version. Um, so if you would like, Jennifer will send this out to you when she sends all of the um, the materials that you need so that you have this 
um, in your hands and you know what we're looking at in the files. Um, and it's really making sure that the child had an IEP prior to being placed because, you know, we look at that least restrictive environment piece. Um, we look at the written notice to make sure that there are conversations about the level of need that a regional program has or, or the level of uh, support that a regional program offers and that the student requires that level of support. So we're looking to make sure that IEPs are in the file, but we're not looking at the IEPs. It's just looking at the IEP that was in place when they came in and that annuals have been done as required by MUSER, that reevaluations have been done as, as um, required by MUSER, that um, if the child is of an age to have a transition plan, that it's part of their IEP, um, that evaluations are in the file if they've had those three-year reviews. So, um, that's the information that we're looking for as part of your files. And you have from now until, I mean, gosh, probably site visits aren't starting till January, right? They're not going earlier than that this year, are they, Jennifer? No, Carly, I can see both of Carly and Jennifer. We're actually starting like the end of January, beginning of February this year. Okay, so that's when site visits will be starting and you'll find out when your site visit is. Um, you know, with plenty of time prior to that. Uh, so you have between now and then to chase down your sending districts and, and all that kind of stuff to make sure that you have all this information in the files. If you don't have it, it's not the end of the world. Um, but what will happen is that your post-visit letter will say, hey, you need a copy of, you know, the written notice from the 30-day review in the file. That's that's what will be on that letter of correction. Does that all make sense? Hopefully. Okay. It's yes. pretty straightforward. Yeah. Uh, B13 indicator, if you are, in fact, you guys are high school, so we really encourage you to come to the B13 training. Um, making sure that your transition plans are uh, compliant is huge. Um, these are the pieces of the B13 indicator. Um, Julie has been sending out or she's been scheduling B13 trainings. I'm not sure if they're sent out to districts yet. They're not. I'm, I'm looking. Um, but we really encourage you to have your teachers come to these trainings and she'll make sure that the regional programs are included um, when these training dates go out. And they are recorded. They're on our website. Um, so we need, we need to make sure that the advance written notice has the purpose of the meeting and that the child is invited to the meeting, um, that if there's any agencies that are invited by you, that you have the parent's prior consent signed prior to that invitation going out, um, to invite them. So we look at the advance written notice for that. And we also look at 9G of the IEP, where it says um, something like, are there any other agencies involved in transition planning, et cetera, et cetera. So that's where we might see things like voc rehab. So if you as a dis as the regional program are inviting the voc rehab person, make sure to get that parent's prior consent prior to or before asking them. If the parent invites them, no problem. Just on the written notice, you can put invited by parent and that is covered in the B13 training. Uh, we look in the written notice to make sure that there it, the post-secondary goals are updated annually, that there are age-appropriate assessments, that there are goals in education training, employment, and independent living, that the course of study is all four years, and that 9F of the transition plan is not child will statements, that it's a bulleted list of the services um, that are going to help the child reach those goals. Any questions about the B13 indicator? Not a question, Leora, just a comment. I know you guys did a great job last year offering like an AM session and a 
p.m. Mm -hmm. session. Um, we're just hopeful it, it is it is hard for us to do yeah. things when our students are here, but Wednesday afternoons, I know you guys had some last year, worked out well because that's our early release day. So I think just understanding most regional programs don't have a slew of subs to come in yes. and cover kids. I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. We'll take that into consideration. And it's also possible that if you reach out to Julie, you could schedule your own B13 training yes. at whatever time works best for you. Thank you, Leora. I was just going to throw that out there. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> Is the B13 trainings the same thing as the Transition Tuesdays with the DOE? No. Um, Transition Tuesdays is with Titus, and she oversees that, um, she sees oversees the transition and the eligibility of 22, so there's awesome information there. This team collects the compliance data. So this B13 training is really aligned to compliance. Um, Titus's trainings are more about, more beyond compliance pieces. Uh, okay. So the documents that you want to have available during the site visit are the written notice at the placement of the program, all written notices since placement and within the last three years, including the written notice of the 30-day review, as long as it's within three years, IEPs in effect at placement if they're within three years, all IEPs since placement um, and within at least three years, including current IEPs, transition plans if applicable, and that's if applicable because, as you know, some regional programs are, well, and, um, you know, don't have high school programming, although most do, um, and a copy of uh, the recent evaluations just to make sure that everything is in that file. Um, so after the site visit, we are going to review, um, well, I could have rewritten this because it's not, they're not paper anymore, they're in an Excel spreadsheet. So we're going to put everything together on our spreadsheets, and then you'll be issued a post-visit letter um, that literally will say, okay, you were missing the 30-day review written notice, please make sure that's in the file, et cetera. Um, and it so it details the students with the findings and then corrective action if necessary. And you have a year to submit all the documentation that should be completed to close that corrective action. So for the desk audit piece, um, we're really looking at those B13 transition plans to make sure that they're compliant. We're looking for an accuracy document, which would be completed by the program director, just saying that, um, and it's the same one that we use for public schools. It just says that whatever you're submitting to the best of your knowledge is, you know, accurate representation of your, of your regional program. Um, fund authorization letters. Those are the letters that say who can, um, emit special education funds for the regional program, um, and those should be um, uh, issued or written by the fiscal agent and certification. All of your evidence can be submitted to monitoring.doe at maine.gov. Very much encourage you to make sure that you put um, somewhere in your email to that address that this is for such and such regional program, et cetera, so that it's really clear what we're looking at. Um, we have resources here, and Jennifer was kind enough to update this, so that is actually accurate because I had forgotten to. Um, so this is where you can find our professional development calendar with all of those office hours and other um, scheduled PD for IEP writing for the B13, um, required documentation, all of the laws and regulations, forms and reporting. Um, and then if you uh, bill to main care, then there is some guidance on required documentation for main care. Okay, what questions came up? Were there any of that I missed? Um, Leora, I was wondering, uh, when I worked with you guys last, I was in 61, and sometimes you would 
allow us to send you something in advance to say, um, can you just take a peek at this? Mm -hmm. um, wondering, I, again, I have seen our um, plan and everything here. I'm just wondering, and I don't know if you guys are willing to do this, if we sent what's currently in place and you could say, nope, you got a, this is missing or that's missing. We'll do our own first, but I, I don't know if you guys still have the time to do that. But I know in the past, you've been very willing to support districts with thinking we have something correct and asking, and then before you actually came and looked. I don't know if you're still willing yes. to do that or not. We're but. still willing to do that. We ask if it is student-specific information. Um, because of that memo 0902, we have to be really careful when we look at actual like student-specific information, because if we see non-compliance, then we have to ask you to fix it and then show us prong two fixing of it. So when you send us something like, you know, I have a copy of your cooperative agreement, your current one, and I'm going to go through that. Um, That's the one I'm talking about. <laughs> exactly. Perfect. I'm going to go through that actually with Jennifer. She might not know that yet, but hey, Jennifer, we're going to do that. Um, and we're going to make sure um, that all the pieces are in there. So we'll get back to you about that as well. But if there's other information, transition plans, et cetera, that you want us to look at, just send the transition plan, not the whole IEP and all that kind of stuff, because then we can give you that information without asking for those extra uh, corrections. Does that make sense? It does. Thank you so much. Perfect. Um, so you guys, I'm pretty sure most of you have my information too, and I'm going to be kind of helping out with the pre regional programs for a while as Jennifer, um, you know, takes things over. So you might see my name on emails here and there. So that's not to worry, perfectly fine. Um, but we're very happy to, you know, help through this process and, um, you know, make it as easy for you guys as possible. I'm going to close this. Um, any other questions that you guys are thinking about that you want to make sure you, you ask? If under the, the programming uh, question, so if our kids are able to access um, the technical school mm -hmm. um, in Oxford, we should talk about that should be listed as one of the options, right? Yes, and that is wonderful. It makes our hearts very happy when we hear about kids being able, especially our special education kids in a regional program, because so many of them are hands-on learners. So that makes us super excited to hear about. So yeah. All right. Well, we we're free. You have 17 extra minutes uh, to get back. And again, do not hesitate to reach out with questions as they come up and you will be hearing from Julie, maybe me here and there and Jennifer as we go through the process. Excellent. Well, thank you guys so much. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.